and whenever you're ready, Frisa. Yeah, yeah. Hello to everybody. I'm so happy that I'm here and I can talk about Night Sky with all you guys. Good morning, good evening. Uh, it's 10 o'clock at night here, and now I'm in Tehran, the capital of Iran. So welcome to my night story. My name is Parisa. Parisa means uh, like a fairy. So you're going to hear fairy tales. I'm gonna to talk about how I use night escape photography to help protect the night. I've divided my presentation into two main parts. First of all, I'll talk about my story. Second, we look at seven stories from seven different parts of Iran. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end of my presentation. Let's start. Okay, villages with night sky full of stars, villages that people used to live there for hundreds of years. Some are now abandoned, but some are still full of life. These old houses show the people who once lived there and the night sky was a part of their living environment. There are secrets hidden in these villages that attract people. For example, a few years ago, I heard from a gardener in one of these villages, there is a star, when it rises, turns pomegranate seeds ripe and red. To discover that star, we traveled to the center of Iran where pomegranate has been the main product for many years. We should dive into the cultures related to the night sky. Follow the relation between the earth and the night sky. In fact, the relationship between culture and nature to keep the natural darkness of the night. The night sky is the unknown part of the nature for most people in 21st century. It should come with familiar concepts, which people experience it. So uh, people will understand it deeper and better. For example, in Persian cuisine, there is a delicate spice. It is used at least once in a week. Its name is saffron. Indigenous farmers who apply the old methods believe that the aroma of saffron is disappeared by sun. So, it should be peak at night before sunrise. I started my journey 18 years ago. I used to go astronomy school and participate in astronomy tours and events and take photos when others observe the night sky. Amateur astronomers were the main audience of my photos in those years. Then I realized I need to expand my audience. I believe that photos do their mission well when photos add more people from different backgrounds to the lovers of the night sky. There is a desert area near my city. It's a four hour drive, a place with a dark sky. We used to go there at least once a year to capture the stars. 16 years ago, I went there for the first time. There was no one on that night. We had few kilometers hiking to witness big untouched sand dunes and hills that were made by a smooth desert sand. But a few years later, we saw car traces and remains of campfires and irresponsible travelers. We were amateur astronomers with a sky map in hand spending our night in darkness and silence, but others had different approach and different impact. So untouched dark sky places change by one by. I found tourism to be an effective way to control the impact of travel. I found out courses to learn tourism and qualify to be tour guide. I started this process seven years ago to understand ecotourism, heritage, animals, biodiversity, and ecology and plants and so on. What is the heritage? It's something that comes to us from the past and we have to use it responsibly 
and keep it for the future. Actually, the concept of protection and conservation. Then my new project started, making content of heritage that has relationship with the night sky. People live with their local heritage and they have history with their heritage. Finding connection between the heritage and the night sky make it meaningful. Then I designed an action plan to document the heritage which is related to the natural darkness. Imagine a bokche with lots of stories, stories about people's life and the heritage at night. Iranian bokche is an angular piece of fabric topped uh, with a tied knob. Seems simple and silent out, but has a word of story inside it. Now, let's move on to my next topic, first project, saffron-based lifestyle. Here was a destination for our project for three years because of this story. Saffron should be picked before sunrise to preserve the taste and the aroma. It means that indigenous farmers work at night, so it's possible to find interesting stories about night sky there. These days, most saffron is produced industrially and it's hard to find the local agriculture, which is registered as an intangible heritage. We went to the field with farmers, picked flowers in harvest season at night, then had breakfast at the farmland and separated expenses, expensive filaments from the flowers. Now saffron are ready to bundle and dry. I did this for several nights to find a saffron field away from light pollution. I didn't do this work just to get good photos. I spent time with the farmers so they felt comfortable with me. Then I could document their lives. Most of the local farmers who work in traditional way our grandparents' generation, and their children are occupied in other jobs. They didn't experience the night sky wonders as their parents. Actually, it's less than two generations that the natural darkness and human connection with nature have disappeared in this region. So I think if people became aware it's easy to make the connection again. I asked the old farmers about the local names of the stars and night sky stories and usages of the stars. They remembered local names and explained how they used the night sky to navigate and estimate, for example, praying time and sharing agricultural waters. As a result of this project, I have a series of contents about saffron-based lifestyle that can make public awareness about night sky. Because the story of saffron happened under the, uh, under the starry sky. Saffron is a familiar concept that comes with night sky to give more attention about it. You can see a saffron documentary that I made in my YouTube channel. I send you the link. Moving to the next story, Kanat, life-giving, underground watering system to bring water from mountains to desert, to use for agriculture and drinking, a concept that is registered as a world heritage in UNESCO and FAO. I met a Mogani. Mokani is a master of making handmade underground water canals in Iran. I asked him, have you ever worked at night? In the past, everything was made, was, was handmade. 
If it took a long time to repair a watering system, they also worked at night, he said. They stayed in underground handmade rooms called Bukan. They must know the night sky because they work at night in desert. Don't you think? I spoke. My father used stars to estimate the time, date, and season in desert. My father learned from my grandfather. My grandfather learned from his father, he answered. What about you? Do you know the night sky? I asked. I have not learned the night sky yet, but I have to learn. Then I can teach my kids, he answered. They are respectful about Qanat. They use white and neat and clean clothes to enter, to enter the, can the canals. We got back home. Then I printed this photo and sent it to them as a gift of appreciation. On this project, we experienced natural darkness together. And we had a chance of influencing local people and talked about light pollution. I usually try to find local influencers. For example, this Mogani is one of the youngest experts to make the underground canals for a well-known family. He's an admired person in maintenance of canal structures. Let's turn now to their story. A town full of stars. We found locals that know the night sky because of their job. We spent the whole night in a desert for nightscape photography. And we had a meeting with the locals in front of a water reservoir the day after. Water Reservoir is an underground man-made lake to access Ganot water for, uh, for desert people, <clears throat> either drinking or washing purpose. This town is, min is, in the, is in the middle of desert. The night sky was the nature of this city until a few years ago. People who lived without light pollution have many stories about the night sky. One of the locals told us a story. When he was young, he traveled with his father on camel train in deserts, and they went to distant cities for business purposes. Because of the extreme heat, the camels moved at night, so they had to know the night sky well to navigate and understanding time. Indigenous people had amazing tales about constellations. They call Canopus star by its local name, Sehil. Canopus star has different names and different story in different cultures. The locals told the story about Canopus. Seven brothers kidnap Sehil's child. The seven brothers are big deeper constellations. One of double stars in Big Deeper, Miser and Alkar, is Sahil's child, whose name is Soha. Sahil has a backpack made of the skin of goat's body, which Sahil fill it with flour for a long trip. Then Sahil goes from the south to the north of the sky to return the stolen child. But Sahil hasn't got enough food. It's impossible to finish that trip. So this cycle repeats every year. You can see Canopus star in this picture exactly in the top of hill. Canopus star is the second brightest star in, in the night sky. In Iran, it rises a little above the horizon and it stays there for a short time. It's possible to be observed just in fall and winter. The constellations had lo local names. And for us to understand, local people drew the constellations. One of the locals sang a song about the constellations. 
I've heard several indigenous literature about night sky, songs that could not found in written sources, and we know them as oral history. That gathering was wonderful. There was a good time to talk about night sky on a red carpet at the historical water reservoir with people from several generations, different cultures and cities. The fourth story is about a town without light, Charagabad. Charagabad means lantern town. Sistan and Baluchistan is one of the untouched region in Iran, a place where you can experience an absolute indigenous life. It is possible to see the relationship with nature there, the relationship that has been dimming during the history. For example, kids make their toy with plants and stone. A village without any electricity, as they haven't experienced any light pollution, they have a real and deep connection with natural darkness. They sleep outside under the starry sky in summer nights. They have gathering at nights with the moonlight and sit on handmade vickers together. I spent time with kids and we discussed about the night sky. Soon, they will be access to the power lines. I hope the children become aware of the importance of natural darkness before the electricity comes. Maybe they use it better in a sustainable way. Let's go to the untold narratives about women. Here is Tajmer a small border village at Iran-Afghanistan border. People were nomads and recently they forced to choose sedentism, living in one place for a long time due to climate change. So it should be interesting to see their lifestyle. It's like watching a living history, the space between nomad life and rural life. I asked the villagers, especially the women, if they know the night sky. I had focused on women in this village because in extremely religious villages, women are not heard and women's narrative are rarely told. One of the oldest women of the village was introduced to me and they said she probably knows the sky. So I went to visit her. The women of the house had painted their fingers with henna. I asked them to put henna on me. Henna must be left on the hand for several hours to apply the color. In the meantime, we chatted until the sky got dark. The streets of the village had excessive lights, but the village was located in an area without light pollution. And if we stand in dark, we could see the starry sky very well. When I asked that woman, Fatima, to tell everything she knows, to tell everything she knows about the night sky, she said she is old and sick and don't remember anything. But I said, let's go out together to look at the stars. You might remember. It, you might remember it again. It got dark. Fatima and I, with her grandchildren, went to the yard and turned off the lights. My guess was right. After watching the stars for a few minutes, Fatima remembered many things. She told us how to estimate the harvest season and other agriculture activities season using the rising and setting time of Orion. The grandchildren and I were listening. I wasn't allowed to take pictures of women's face. So I took pictures of our shadows in the backyard. Women and children don't go out 
uh, do, don't go to, uh, don't go out of house at night in this village. So the best place to talk and hear about light pollution is the backyard. She also read us a very interesting Persian poem, a poem that the main subject was the relationship between constellations and agricultural seasons. After that trip, I printed the photos for those villagers, as I usually do to appreciate their hospitality. Moving on to the next project, companionship with the stars. Whether nomads who live in deserts or highlands, this lifestyle has a close relationship with nature, both sides, the day and the night. So in the, next, in the next station, we experience the nomad's life. There are several national heritages that are related to the nomad life. One of them is the nomad's kid cradle. Its name is Tahde, a small lightweight cradle, easy to carry by horse in migration season. Cradle comes with lullabies. Lullabies are another heritage that come with mama, especially nomadic mothers. We were looking for a nomad family that still have Tahde. Then we planned our trip to some highlands to visit nomads. We stayed with the nomads for a few nights and took photos of their lifestyle and the night sky above their life. Almost all of us have memories with the cradle. I'm sure through seeing these pictures, for a moment, you imagined yourself in the cradle of your childhood. Was the sky above your home full of stars when you were a child or not? We also found out shepherds know the night sky very well because they spend several days and nights with their animals in the mountains away from the tribe. They use the stars to find the way and timing. Although now they have mobile phones and don't need the start, but we heard their memories of the time when there was no mobile phone. And the last story of this presentation, pomegranate and the night sky. Pomegranate seeds become red and ripe when a star shines in October. We got to Agda, a city in the middle of the desert, to discover this mystery. A local guide helped us to meet Sayyid Mamak, the person who told this mystery. He didn't remember the name of that star, but he said in the past, people estimate the time and date by using the stars. Rising a specific star, says it's the time to harvest pomegranates. Actually, the night sky works as an agriculture calendar. We appreciated Sayyid Mamad for the details he said. He smiles and said, I believe learning and teaching are types of worship. He addressed an old man who probably knows more details about that star. We were looking for him and finally find a 100 years old man who is the oldest person in the town. We met him in a historical house in the town. He told many stories about the night sky, the stories about the years of living with starry sky, without any electricity and lights. He also knew that star, it's Canopus star, as we guessed it. But it has a stronger taste when we hear it from locals.
Pinnipus appears in fall in Northern Hemisphere. Pomegranates become red and ripe at the same time. So Canopus declares the time to harvest pomegranates. I've met a series of photos, videos, and sounds about Canopus and the concept of pomegranates and the night sky during the past two years. You can see the films in my YouTube channel and the photos in my Instagram. I hope I could complete these missions to remind the importance of the night sky to local people through their own memories and increase the public awareness about natural darkness, healthy lifestyle, and pay attention to oral history. Publishing photo books, documentary filmmaking, photo exhibition, and storytelling are my ability to do this, to see, to hear, to taste, and to experience the heritage at night. Wherever the stars are visible, there are countless stories to tell. My projects are always about exploring the connection between the earth and the night sky. Actually, the connection between people and stars. There is a law in the sky that the further you look at a star, the further you look into the past. It made me fascinated with astronomy from the first look at the sky. For us, the big city residents, concept of far is anywhere that the stars are still available. And I found our history there in the middle of darkness near the stars. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for such an amazing presentation. Um, we haven't had a lot of questions. I'd love to see any additional questions that you might have, but one thing that really impressed me a lot with your presentation is that last bit with um, the concept of distance is anywhere that an urban person can see stars. And I'd love to hear maybe a little bit more of your take on that because you've done so much with urban and rural um, stargazing and, and the cultural heritage of that. You know, do you have any interesting eye-opening experiences that you've had there? Uh, you know, when, when you go to urban area, you go far from cities, uh, you see people who have a deep connection with nature, a real connection, a connection that you never, you know, experience it in cities anywhere. People who live with nature, people who live with nature I can say have a big heart and you can see it exactly when you talk to them. Uh, and it's really inspired me. All right, and kind of a more of an astrophotography question for you. When you set up your, your shots, do you set up that shot to actually like, I'm looking, I'm thinking of that pomegranate in the forefront with the stars in the background. When you think about that shot, do you think I'm going to put the stars first? Do I do I put the culture first? Do I put my experience first? What's your thought process in framing your images? Um, I do my project as a series of photos. So I can, uh, for example, in one photo, focus on culture. Another photo, focus on, you know, the astronomy side of astrophotography. But I want to say my uh, my genre of photography is actually nightscape photography, not astrophotography. It's a big difference between these two, you know, th th these two type of photography. Uh, a person who astrophotographer focus on scientific side, you know, but a person who focus on nightscape photography actually want to find a connection between science and people, and and. Uh, my main goal is to how uh, how I can 
uh, actually take more attention to the night sky. Um, I'm, I'm talking about people who don't have any experience about astronomy. When I wanna talk to that people, it is more easier to go uh, to start the conversation with cultural side. All right, and we're gonna we're gonna focus here on some of the questions that have come through as well. And I will um, turn over the next question to Michael. Yes. Parisa, thank you very much for your presentation. It's beautiful, uh, such you know, warming stories about humanity and, and our connection with nature. Um, uh, Nancy Harder actually has kind of a question along those lines. What would be the uh, constellation that we would recognize to harvest pomegranates? It's Canopus a star. Canopus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can you tell us uh, what uh, part of the year uh, we would see that at the highest? Uh, in the middle of winter. Winter, okay. Yeah. One of the questions that we have is when you're capturing images, I mean, even in your beautiful headshot there, you have this amazing camera. Um, have you had success with capturing images with a cell phone camera? Do you have any hints and tips for people that want to get started that may not want to go into such amazing equipment at first? Yeah, um, we can take a photo of night sky with mobile phone also. For example, last version of iPhone, Samsung, uh, we can do photo with that phones also, but um, we should stack photos. I mean, we should take lots of photos with our phone and then st stack them together in Photoshop to increase the detail and decrease the noise. Uh, Parisa, Robert Parrish asks, um, have you seen any positive movement to address light pollution from your work? Yeah, yeah, I, I see. Um, you know, because these days people can make money through astrotourism. Because of that, people in villages far from cities control their light pollution uh, because they can make money through astrotourism. Uh, and I see it in Iran a lot. Uh, it, um, actually, the, the person who, uh, who mm, how can I explain it? The person who make money through astrotourism do it in villages. I see it a lot. Mm. Do you think there might be a push eventually in in moving it beyond sort of the rural or village into some of the large into maybe medium sized cities? And is there a way that you could approach that, or that you would recommend we approach that? Uh, please repeat your question again. I can't understand it very well. Sure. So. Um, you said about addressing light pollution with astrotourism in rural yeah. areas. But what about like people that are in smaller cities? Is there a oh. way that either you've had the experience of assisting them or that you would recommend um, in I'm, your encounters with photographing different areas? Nothing, the, actually in my country, nothing happened in big city about light pollution yet. Uh, because, you know, uh, in the big city, uh, you, you, you should, convince governments and uh, it's very difficult here but in the village and uh, urban country uh, you should speak to people and people understand it Parisa I have a question what is uh one shot that you went far and above to you know as far as effort goes uh to get you know was it like perhaps in a remote, a very remote part? Um, you know, what what is one photo that stands out to you in your uh, in your history that was just a very difficult shot to get? Um, mm, let me choose from this story. These are stories that we talked about them. Yeah. Um, Cheravabad is a town that people can't speak uh, Farsi. 
they have their own local language. Mm -hmm. And it was really difficult to make connection with them. And actually, there is no road, there is no actual road to, uh, to that village. Um, that village is far is two hours far from any town and city, and there is no person who can understand what I'm saying, uh, except some children, because on that village, uh, ch children are started go to a school and they can speak Farsi, so make connection with them was uh, really really difficult, and also. Uh, reaching there was so difficult. I understand. Thank you. Sorry, we're going through the questions that we're seeing. Um, do you have any tips for photographing the sky near cities with moderate light pollution? Near city? I think it's the better way is use light pollution filters uh if you want to have a dark sky but uh, if you if you want to talk about exactly the light pollution you do not need any filters because you want to show light pollution uh so just a camera and lens with with really open aperture it's enough for you to capture the the exact light pollution uh Ahmed asks, um, he says that you gave nice examples about farmers uh, that you have met. Have you met with any people who, uh, or have any stories um, from folks, from people who live uh, near the coast, you know, fisher, fishermen or uh, yeah. anything like that? Have you, have you come across those people? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, fishermen also use the stars to find their way to ring during ocean. And um, I heard from them also. They have lots of amazing story about ocean and a night sky. Actually, they know all the constellation, but with their local name. And uh, they use them for timing, uh, navigates, and, and so on. I know this is probably... Um sort of out of nowhere that maybe you you aren't quite prepared for, but what is your favorite image or your most meaningful to you image that you've ever taken? And is that something that you could share with us? Uh, let's talk about saffron because saffron is really important in Iran. And way, when we talk about saffron, everybody knows it and everybody, everybody you know, live with it. So I can make a connection with night, night sky, with saffron. I mean, true saffron, I can uh, make more influence on people in my country. Uh, so I really like my saffron projects. Parisa, what uh, I think what a lot of people may be uh, wondering is what, what equipment do you use? What, what is your camera? What is your lens that you take out uh, to get these shots? Okay, all these photos uh, are taken by Canon 60, and uh, my lens is 1635 uh, Canon Type 3. And, and do you have, is there a reason for that? Uh, you know, do you have a preference? What, what led you to choose that particular camera body? Um, you know, in this, in this budget range, uh, Canon 60 is better one. Okay. Yeah. Um, Robert asked, uh, have you seen any positive movement to address light pollution from your work? As I told, it's happened to uh, urban and village a lot. Yeah. Do you teach people uh, how to take photos? Yeah, yeah. We have, in Iran, we have, um, astrophotography tour and classes and something like that. I bet that'd be really fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So does anybody have any further questions? Give it a second here. 
All right, I'm not seeing any further questions coming through, but I do kind of want to let everybody know we have um, expanded the audience. So many of us here um, are not currently advocates to help push forward the idea of reducing light pollution. Um, so Michael will very kindly share the link to join our advocates group um, to be able to start kind of working in your own communities, especially because obviously, you know, there are filters for helping with astrophotography, but um, if you want to just go out and do some stargazing, it can be very difficult, especially in those urban areas like we've been discussing. So um, we are happy to have people uh, join our advocate network and get involved on the local level. We do run a monthly advocate um, presentation as well on how to get active and what movements you can join. Um, and I'm sure Michael can go more in depth in that instead of these uh, smaller presentations that I do. Um, so I don't know if Michael, you want to talk about well, that uh, work a little bit. I'd say before we do, I think we have a few more questions that just came oh, through. Sweet. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ro Robert Parrish again, he asked another question. Have you seen any overlap in uh, the star lore, star stories uh, from Iran to other parts of the world? Yeah, um, I have been in Africa, I think four or five times. And um, I see something like that. Uh, I see something like our farmers in African farmers also. And uh, I was in India two years ago for solar eclipse. Uh, I also see something like this in India. For example, Indian people, uh, have something about harvest season for tea and night sky. And uh, also I, I, I have been, uh, I've been in uh, Northern Europe for photograph Aurora. And uh, I know some tales about Northern lights also. And uh, I think uh, in the world, there is lots of tales about uh, star night sky. Uh, but there are there are not written, you know. There are mm -hmm. oral history. We should we should uh, search for it. Of course. All right. So going through the questions that have come in um, afterwards, can you talk about what you're looking for in the photo contest when you're judging? Uh, oh, <laughs> and you know, uh, I think everybody understand now. A story is really important for me. Um, so I'm looking forward about this story, how they, how people talk with their photo. Hmm. Uh, Parisa, do you know anybody who shoots on film? Um, uh, you mean filming night sky in a live, for example? Uh I think I think this person is asking like um like the film actual film um, uh -huh. instead of digital. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, yeah. I don't know anybody do this in these days. <laughs> yeah, not not so common uh, anymore. I wouldn't think. Yeah, not so common. Exactly. Hey, did you grow Did you grow up with a very dark sky? Uh, you know, to that kind of inspired you to get into this. No, no, I grew up in Tehran, and Tehran is a very big, light polluted city. I see. How long are your exposures when you're taking photos? I'm assuming it depends on multiple things. So if you wanna go into that a little bit more. Yeah, um, my, expo my photos exposures is between 10 seconds to 30 seconds. It depends on the subject. Uh, for example, when I wanna uh, capture a photo in a very, very dark place in the middle of desert, uh, I can shoot 30 seconds, but when I'm near town and cities, I cannot uh, open my exposure a lot. Uh, I shoot near 10 seconds. And also it depends on my lens and my aperture. Um, when my aperture is open, uh, for example, 2.8, 1.4, now I can uh, actually 
uh, shoots an exposure about 10 minutes, 10 second, 15 second. But uh, if I need closer aperture, depends on how a depth of field I need. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to shoot for a longer exposure, 30, 40. Prisa, do you offer any uh, like classes or workshops online to, you know, give more technical information about uh, choosing equipment, setting up your shots and your exposure all, all the way to processing? I think uh, now everybody can find lots of information on YouTube. <laughs> and um, also there is lots of uh, actually online classes. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know if you know Bobak Tafrishi or not. He is an expert on astrophotography. Um, he is an astrophotographer in National Geographic. Bobak Tafrishi, I think he has some tour around the board. And uh, also uh, there is a workshop every year uh, in United States, Night Escape Photographer, I think. And the people can participate in that workshop also. And uh, if, if you search on internet, I think you can find more, uh, more workshop. I think it's good to participate in different workshop with different teacher because sure. everybody has uh, special things to tell to you. So it's good to learn astrophotography with different teachers. A yeah, very good point. Um, so uh, this go this question comes from Nancy. Uh, she's uh, talking about your interaction with villagers. You know, people from the very small, very remote places. Um, you know, did you ever talk to them about light pollution? Like, did they understand what light pollution is, given that they may live very far from it? Yeah, yeah, they understand. But you should take time. You know, you should spend time with them. And uh, yeah, for example, it's it's not happened just one hour talking. It's happened one week talking. You know, you should go to that go to you should go to that village, stay there for one week, and communicate with people, and um, explain to them every as aspect of light pollution, and they can understand because light pollution. Uh, has a has a, a connection with plants, as everybody knows, and uh, farmers wanna uh, protect their uh, plants. And then you talk about light pollution and bad uh, effect on plants. They mm -hmm. understand it. Bad effect on animals. They understand it. Oh, okay, good. So it it wasn't a a, a huge revelation. Uh, to the people that you've met with they they understood what they what they have living where they are well that's great yeah so when this is from tom um who is also our board president so hi tom um while shooting the night sky in remote dark sky areas have you experienced starlink satellites have they affected your shoots at all for the satellite system yeah, yeah. Um, um, the last one, I think it was one year ago. Um, I shoot photo in some remote area, and I saw Starlink. Yeah, it, it's a it's a really big issue. I have a, a question from me. Is there you you said that you've photographed many celestial events, aurora, uh, eclipses? I think you mentioned. Is there a is there a shot that you haven't gotten yet, but is on your at the top of your list that you really want to get? Yeah, I I went to uh, Brazil for photograph Southern Hemisphere uh, night sky, but due to cloud and 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 lots of things, I couldn't actually. I haven't a good photo of Southern Hemisphere. So taking photo in Southern Hemisphere. Uh, now in my uh, is in my list. You want to see the Magellanic clouds and everything, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any 
further questions that anybody might have. And while we wait for those questions to come in, I will say uh, Tom's question about satellites is very timely because next month uh, we will be talking about dark skies and satellites, um, the impact of you know, monitoring for deep space objects, so lots of really important conversations next month as well. So watch your email boxes for that invitation to come through. Um, just waiting to see if there's any further questions or otherwise we'll just do some last minute cleanup and, and housekeeping going on here. Oh, Roger just came through with a question for us. So have you used a telescope in your photography? Yes, yes, I have. Um, but not these years. Uh, at, uh, at first, I started my journey with telescope and deep sky photography. So I use telescope a lot. Okay. And also, I have uh, lots of video about astrophotography in my YouTube channel. It's for, uh, it's for uh, someone who knows Farsi. If everybody here know Farsi, you can check my YouTube channel to learn astrophotography there. Okay. Um, Margaret, that's a great question. Um, so we do send out the link when we invite you to the next month's presentation. Um, for every and all recordings that we have, we always send it out with the invitation. Um, I do my best to remember to post these uh, recording links in our Advocate Slack channel as well. So if you are a member there, um, you will be linked to this recording as well. All right. So with that, we're going to get ready to close out. We do encourage everybody to become an advocate at the link that Michael had posted. Um, please feel free to join our Advocate Slack channel as well. Um, there's some great resources available there. Um, and I hope to see everybody next month. Michael, did you have anything you wanted to add as well? No, um, I, I, I put the uh, link to the Dark Sky Advocate Network uh, page from our website in the chat uh, once again. Um, if you, I'll also put my email um, in here. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, the Advocate Network, um, we will, uh, I will gladly help you get set up with the Advocate Slack channel, um, or if, uh, if I can ask my good friend Betty Maya to uh, put in the link for the uh, Slack channel uh, here in the chat, that would be much appreciated. But yes, uh, as she just said, once you join the network, you'll get information on how to join us on Slack anyway, so um, but feel free to reach out to us uh, at any point. We will gladly help you get set up and everything like that. Uh, oh, thank you, Betty Maya. Put the put the uh, Slack link in there. So, yes, join us. Uh, we have lots of great conversation about very different topics, um, and we're always active. We're a global community, so someone is always there, twenty four hours a day. Um, so we look forward to, to having every newcomer uh, join us on Slack. All right. And my final comment is I want to thank Parisa for such an amazing conversation on the intersection of culture, astrophotography, dark skies, um, you know, all of everything that you covered. It was an absolutely beautiful presentation. So I want to thank you for taking the time to share that with us. Thank you so much. All right.